are rare. And taken together, uh, the data would suggest that the estimate is approximately 1 to 1.3 allergic reactions per million doses of vaccine. And to put that into perspective, you're actually more likely to be hit by lightning where the, the rate is one in 500,000 than you are to have a serious allergic reaction to vaccines. And I actually like that data um, when I'm talking to patients. And interestingly, the allergy to vaccines um, is actually not thought to be the vaccine itself but probably to inactive ingredients in the vaccine or vaccine components. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that because it's important when we're thinking about how to get the history and how to advise the patient that's sitting in front of us as to what to do. And so uh, vaccine ingredients that we often think about are egg, which we've talked about quite a bit um, in relation to several vaccines. And we'll talk about bar in relation to that as well as things like formaldehyde, gelatin, neomycin, thimerosal. And then excipients, on the other hand, are inert substances that are added to vaccines, as well as many other drugs. And they're usually used uh, to stabilize or increase the solubility or theoretically stimulate a stronger immune response um, or even to stabilize the vaccine during transport. And so those are the reasons why these excipients are important, but some of the excipients like polyethylene glycol and polysorbate, which are used for these reasons, um, you know, can be uh, an area of concern. And that's where some of the mRNA vaccines and the Janssen vaccine, um, which have PEG and polysorbate, were brought up to the forefront of the news more recently. So what we also know is, is while there are certain components or excipients that may be responsible for the reaction, what is the pathophysiology? And so there are really a variety of different reasons why these reactions can occur. I think first and most commonly, we often talk about typical allergy. So that's the IgE or the cross-linking of the FC epsilon receptor on mast cells leading to mast cell activation or dregenulation, which is responsible for the immediate reactions and the classic symptoms of allergy of hives, itching, angioedema, respiratory symptoms. But there are also other non-IgE mediated mechanisms that we have to think about. And these could be non-IgE mediated mast cell degranulation that can occur, as you can see on the slide, through activation of complement, um, and that leads to generation of anaphylactotoxins, which basically mimic the symptoms of anaphylaxis, but involve other mediators such as C1Q, C3A, C4, C5A, which you can see on the slide in the orange box. And they really are strong um, immune stimulators of the inflammatory response, but the symptoms can be very similar to an IgE mediated reaction. And then third or another mechanism that we think about is through direct activation of mast cells. And one of the receptors that comes up a lot in the, in the literature is the MRGPRX2, which is on mast cells. And again, causes degranulation of the mast cell and, and symptoms. And then lastly, and maybe less relevant to vaccines are the delayed reactions where we think about um, type four or delayed hypersensitivity. And these reactions are not immediate. They occur uh, weeks or days after. Um, and so probably a little less important to today's talk, but also something that we think about with vaccine reactions. One of the most important publications on this topic was uh, the ICON or the International Consensus Document. Um, and there were numerous authors internationally that put this together. And I highlight this figure from that paper because it's really um, the most important thought process on what to do when you're seeing someone like Barb in the clinic. So first, history, history, history. We've all heard that. And if that history um, is suggestive of an immediate reaction, what you can see in the middle of the slide, is that's when the role of the allergist is, is really important to think about what component 
of that vaccine may have caused the reaction? And is there a role for skin testing, in vitro um, blood testing? And then based on the results of that testing, can you give the vaccine in the office? Whereas the history suggesting a non-immediate reaction, um, that's where the allergist probably doesn't need to be involved. So this could be simply a rash or uh, symptoms that started 24 to 48 hours later. And really the idea that in those cases, the vaccine can be administered. So going back to BARB, um, we talked about the history of wheezing and hives and specifically to the flu level or the quadrivalent influenza vaccine. And the reason why it's important is when you look at this document, which is actually from the CDC, you can see that there are a number of different flu vaccines and the different flu vaccines contain different components. So there are some that contain egg, some that contain polysorbate, ovalbumin, and so on. And so from my perspective as the allergist, this is relevant to my conversation and really guidance. And in her case, she had the vaccine that contained ovalbumin and polysorbate 80. So then what do I do with this history? And so this is actually from our national quad AI vaccine allergy practice parameters, which gives some guidance on what to do when we see someone with a history of allergy is really to think about, was that history suggestive of an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis? And in this case, presumably yes. And so then we think about skin testing and skin testing could be to the vaccine or specific components. Um, and similar to the ICON guideline or, or workflow that I showed you, if it's not presumed to be an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, then essentially really not much to do but to reassure that patient that they can proceed with getting the vaccine. And the question of egg allergy and flu vaccine comes up a lot. And so while it's not relevant in Barb's case, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about this because it seemed to come up quite a bit when individuals were coming with a prior vaccine allergy history to come see us before getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And, and there's a lot of intricacies to it, but I wanted to highlight some main points. The first, is that if the clinical history to the egg allergy is just hives or a cutaneous reaction, you can proceed with the flu vaccine. So if you remember nothing else from today's talk, um, just remember that if the patient is presenting with purely cutaneous symptoms of egg allergy, that there is no contraindication to getting the flu vaccine. And a lot of that is because when you look at the actual egg content in flu vaccine, it's essentially close to zero. And so the idea really is that if you have an egg allergy, you can proceed with flu vaccination. And certainly if that history of egg allergy is more severe, so more than cutaneous um, symptoms, so they had symptoms suggestive of anaphylaxis or they needed epinephrine, then the vaccine can still be given. So even if someone had anaphylaxis to egg, you can safely receive the flu vaccine. But in that case, maybe the patient will feel better having it under the supervision uh, of your office or my office or something like that. But again, it is not a contraindication. So there is not a history of egg allergy that's a contraindication to getting the flu vaccine. And then the last point is if the individual had a severe allergic reaction to the flu vaccine. So now getting back to Barb's case, I think that's where you then think about referring to the allergist and really the ICON guidelines, the quad AI guidelines that I just showed you, where then it's my job to think through what can I do in terms of testing to figure out was there a component to it? Um, was the reaction to the flu vaccine itself? And can I give the flu vaccine in my office? And so when we look at the ICON guidelines, thinking more broadly about 
food allergy and vaccines. So starting with the food component to so someone who has an egg allergy or gelatin allergy or milk allergy, this slide really highlights which vaccines have those components. And really then as the allergist, how do I think about giving that individual the vaccine? Versus if someone comes to me with a vaccine allergy, so if they had a tetanus reaction or an MMR reaction, I can think about skin testing to the vaccine or thinking about the component of the vaccine that caused the problem. And so really in my world, thinking about how do I help this individual proceed with safe vaccination? And is it the food component that's bringing them to see us? Or is it that they had a history of a vaccine allergy that's bringing them to see us? I'm gonna pause briefly there um, before I move on to talking about COVID-19 vaccine allergy to see if there's any question just about vaccine allergy in general that I can address before moving on. We're good to go. All right, sounds good, I'll keep going. So now let's spend a little bit of time talking specifically about the mRNA vaccines and that's specifically the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccine. And we'll talk a little bit afterwards about the Janssen, which is slightly different. Um, so what do we know about these vaccines? And I guess a few important points are that neither of the mRNA vaccines contains any egg. There's no gelatin, there's no latex, but what does it contain? So there's no proteins in these mRNA vaccines, which are really thought to be the, the reason for um, allergic reactions. But what they do contain are, are polyethylene glycol, which is a lipid, and it's the molecular weight is polyethylene glycol 2000. And the reason why the molecular weight is important is when you compare it to higher molecular weights or lower molecular weights, it becomes um, an important part of the conversation, which we'll talk about briefly. So what is polyethylene glycol? Polyethylene glycol is a common water-soluble ingredient that's in many products. Um, it's used in laxatives like Miralax, and it's usually used uh, to slow clearance of the medication or really to improve the water solubility of that medication. And prior to the development of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, polyethylene glycol is not in any other vaccines. And in terms of the literature, um, anaphylaxis to polyethylene glycol is certainly described, but very rare. And so this was a, an important publication that um, was actually published prior to the issue with the COVID-19 vaccines. But when you looked at the data from the last 15 to 20 years, there was on average about four cases per year of an anaphylactic reaction to polyethylene glycol reported to the FDA. So I anticipate there are probably other cases, but this is just what was in the literature based on being reported to the FDA. And then what about polysorbates and why is that important? So polysorbate 80 is what is in the Janssen vaccine as an excipient. Um, and so we've heard a lot about polyethylene glycol and polysorbates because of these three vaccines, which are FDA approved. And interestingly, polysorbates um, are the main excipient in a variety of other vaccines that we have, including tetanus, influenza, HPV, and so on. You can see them all on the list. And theoretically, some similarity in chemical structure between polyethylene glycol and polysorbate 80, raising the concern initially that maybe there's some cross-reactivity of individuals who might have a reaction to one of the COVID-19 vaccines being at risk for having an allergic reaction to the other COVID-19 vaccines. And so now looking at the timeline, we all know that starting in December of 2019 is really when COVID-19 infections were described. And by March of 2020, we had pharmaceutical companies initiating clinical trials with vaccines. And by December 11th and December 18th, so very early or so very late in 2020, FDA approval of 
COVID-19 vaccines. And so within days of approval of the COVID-19 vaccines, there were allergic reactions reported. And I think you probably all remember there were two, three cases out of the United Kingdom of allergic reactions to potentially anaphylactic reactions in healthcare workers, because those are the individuals that were getting the vaccines first. And in those cases, both of those healthcare workers had a prior history of a food or medication allergy. And then in the United States, if you remember back, there were two healthcare workers with presumed allergic reactions in Alaska. The first case was someone who didn't really have a prior history of allergy, but had flushing and shortness of breath within 10 minutes and required epinephrine. And the second case of a healthcare worker within that 24 hours having eye swelling, lightheadedness, and a scratchy throat. And unfortunately, these reactions then were all over the media and led to significant concern about allergy to the vaccines, which hadn't really been seen in the clinical trials. And so as a result of these reactions, there was a lot of public concern. Maybe now we feel is unwarranted, but at the time, theoretically was leading to a lot of vaccine hesitation. And the CDC put together some guidance on who should or who shouldn't have a vaccine highlighted in green and yellow and red. And instead of going through all of these details, I'm gonna go through a very simplified version of what we feel um, is the CDC guidance at the time and still holds true today. And the idea is that if you have had a history of a reaction to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, the CDC guidance is to refer to allergy. Whereas if you have had a severe allergic reaction to any vaccine or food or drug or venom or latex, you can proceed with COVID-19 vaccination, but have a 30 minute observation. And then everybody else have a 15 minute observation. I'm gonna pause here for one second because this is really very different from any other vaccine. So we do not have this routine 50 minute or 30 minute monitoring with any other vaccine. And so this is really very different and it's really led by the fact that those cases developed very early on and led the CDC to develop this guidance. And what I'm gonna show you later in this talk is that the risk of vaccine reactions with the COVID-19 vaccine is really no different than any of the other existing vaccines. But today, this CDC guidance is still in place, good or bad. We have to follow these, these guidelines or guidance from the CDC. So let's go back to Barb. She um, had a severe allergic reaction to the flu vaccine, had a reaction to immunotherapy, so where does that put Barb? Um, she certainly would fall into the medium risk category because she had a severe allergic reaction to uh, a prior vaccine. Um, and so in my mind, she falls into the medium risk. The vaccine, the flu vaccine that she received though, did have polysorbate. And I had showed you a prior slide with the specific ingredients. And so would she also fall into this higher risk category? And, and yes, she would. And so that's where someone like Barb would then be referred to an allergist. And so what would we do um, based on that history? So in December of 2020, um, me and my colleagues thought through, what do we know about vaccine allergy? What do we know about these vaccines? What do we know about excipients? What do we know about guidance that's out there from ICON and the Quad AI? And we put together an algorithm within a week of all of this happening in December so that our colleagues, our patients really could go forward safely. And we then collected data um, in the spring of 2021 
And this is now the updated guidance based on our experience. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through the nitty gritty because there's a lot that is on here, but what we want you to be able to do is take that clinical history and really help that individual get to the point where they can be vaccinated. And I think we already mentioned briefly at the beginning of the talk is that there is almost nobody that needs a vaccine exemption for an allergic issue. And I'll say that again, because it's such an important concept for you to leave today's talk with is really that there is almost no reason or a very, very rare reason that allergy should lead to a vaccine exemption. And that was our goal with a lot of this work and this publications that we have put forward with these risk ratification algorithms. And so talking about Barb, did she have a history of anaphylaxis? Presumably yes, with the wheezing and the hives, both to the flu vaccine um, that we had talked about. And in her case, possibly including polysorbate AB. So I'm gonna highlight that a little bit. Um, so in our algorithm, she had a possible polysorbate AD reaction. And we know that neither the mRNA vaccines have polysorbate AD. So in her case, it would actually be very reasonable and very safe for her to go forward with either of the mRNA vaccines, which is the Pfizer BioNTech or the Moderna vaccine with 30 minute monitoring following CDC guidance. And so she did. And for the, case, the sake of discussion, we're gonna say that she comes back to us four weeks after having had a, a reaction to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine that you had cleared her for. And what she described is that about two hours after the vaccine, she developed generalized pruritus, but no hives, no rash, no breathing issues. Um, and these symptoms improved within an hour of her taking diphenhydramine. And she wants to now know in your office if she can take the second dose of the same vaccine. And so another part of our work was what happens if someone has a reaction to the first dose? What do we do? And again, very, very rare cases where that individual cannot go on to getting the next dose. And so for Barb, she fell into what we call medium risk, where she had itching, potential reaction. And what we've learned is that these individuals can go on to get the second dose of vaccine with 30 minutes of monitoring and use antihistamines for pre-medication. Whereas if someone presents to you with subjective symptoms, which maybe she was, delayed symptoms, non-allergic symptoms, they can absolutely go on to get the second dose of the COVID-19 series or now the third dose or the booster. And so this was a, a, a paper that focused exactly on this issue. So we collaborated with four other uh, academic centers and completed a retrospective study looking at patients who were reporting an immediate reaction to either of the mRNA vaccines. And so we looked at 189 patients at the time of this publication, 130 with Moderna and 59 with Pfizer BioNTech, and they had reported immediate allergic reactions. And this could have been flushing, dizziness, tingling, throat tightness, hives, wheezing. Um, and about 17% of these cases uh, met criteria, Brighton criteria uh, for anaphylaxis. And what we found was that 159 of these individuals went on to receive the second dose and tolerated it. And this included 19 of those 32 patients that had presumed met criteria for anaphylaxis with that first dose. And so I think this again shows that those individuals that are having symptoms, presumably of an allergic reaction, can go on to receive that second dose safely. And a lot of this is where I think as physicians and allergists, we can play a really important role guiding them on um, reassurance, on using antihistamine pre-medication, um, and then probably getting us to a point where I think we don't fully understand the mechanism of these symptoms and these reactions 
Um, and it's some combination of mass cell degranulation, complement mediated reactions. Um, that slide that I showed you early on, where I think we still need to understand what is happening in these individuals that's causing these symptoms, but leaving us with data and reassurance that the majority of these individuals, even when they're having symptoms with that first dose, can go on to receive that second dose safely. I'm gonna pause there for a minute because I think that's another important point that I wanted to make sure that everybody um, understood. And I can certainly take questions at the end, but I think this is an important point that's highlighted um, in this publication. There, there is a, a question here um, related to the, the flu vaccine. Yeah. Um, what do you tell patients who have had an allergic reaction to the flu vaccine, but have been able to tolerate other procedures that may have possibly have other related reactions. And the one that's brought up here is a colonoscopy with Miralax without a problem. Yeah, great question. So the way that we think about it and, and when we look through all these algorithms that we created is those situations come up all the time. And so that's where we think about what was in the vaccines. And so we know that the flu vaccines do not have polyethylene glycol. If anything, they have egg or polysorbate 80, and we talked a little bit about those. And so one of the most important things on history is to find out what vaccines has that individual tolerated. And so the majority of individuals have had the flu vaccine or some of the other routine vaccinations, but none of them have polyethylene glycol. And so if they have tolerated a flu vaccine or other vaccines, then it's very easy to say that they can have Janssen or J&J because that also has polysorbate 80. And then if they've tolerated Miralax or a colonoscopy, then we know that they've tolerated polyethylene glycol and that helps us reassure that individual that they can then also receive the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. So a lot of those important questions, thinking about what they've tolerated helps us guide them on what they can have going forward with the COVID-19 vaccines. Thanks. And then in relationship, or in relation to this slide that you're showing right now, um, the reactions that are reported, are some of these nocebo reactions? Yes, and I have a couple of slides on that. And the idea is that people can have vasovagal reactions that mimic allergic symptoms. You can have anxiety reactions that mimic allergic reactions. And so there is the constellation of all of those as potential explanations for these symptoms that we are attributing to allergic reactions because we don't have anything other than that clinical history. We're not actually observing the individual right in front of us having these symptoms. It is their symptoms that they're reporting. And we can't do anything other than go through that clinical history, but to the point where these data can be used to reassure that individual that even if they have had symptoms that worry them, there's a lot of experience and data and publications now that they can go on to receive that second dose safely. Wonderful, thank you. So what are the data on anaphylactic reactions to the mRNA vaccine, which I think really is important as a whole when we're talking to our patients? And so none were actually reported in the clinical trials, but a small number reported after FDA approval, so in the past now almost year. Um, and in general, the rates are somewhere in the two to five to eight per million, depending on how you're looking at the data or, or the surveillance method. And so I was telling you that the CDC has these guidance around mRNA vaccines and COVID-19 vaccines that we don't have for any other vaccines. And I think a lot of that really was driven by how big of an issue the pandemic was, how exciting it was that we had vaccines. And then unfortunately, a lot of media hype around some of these initial reactions, which again, was it allergic? Was it something else? Was it vasovagal? 
we don't know at this point, but it led the CDC to put forth guidance, which hasn't changed with the 30 minute monitoring, the, you know, 15 minute monitoring, which doesn't exist with any other vaccines. And when you put the data about rates of anaphylaxis for the mRNA vaccines against other vaccines that we use most very commonly, it's really in the same ballpark as you can see on this slide. But I think really for me, the take home message here is that these vaccines, um, yes, allergic reactions occur, but they're extremely rare and it's no different than any of the other vaccines that we commonly give uh, our patients. And so I wanted to also bring up this, this paper, which actually was just um, published and in press um, from Dr. Johnny Peter in South Africa, looking at the rate of reactions to the Janssen or, or the J&J &J vaccine, which I haven't spent a lot of time talking about because this is the first set of data that's really um, been published. And what you see here are um, overall uh, reactions or overall allergic reactions were about 251 to 0.05% or a prevalence of about eight per million doses. And so if I go back to my slide here, eight per million doses is again in the same ballpark as what you're seeing with all of these other vaccines. And really that there were only four cases of anaphylaxis and all those individuals in this uh, cohort at least had had a prior history of drug or vaccine associated anaphylaxis. But again, the take home point being that it's extremely rare. Yes, it occurs, but the rates of anaphylaxis or severe allergic reactions is extremely rare and really no different than what we're seeing with our other vaccines. And so then to, to move on, I wanted to talk quickly about a couple of other aspects of vaccine allergy. And so this is a, a quick case um, that highlights some important points that I wanted to talk about. So this is a 61-year-old a female, has a history of, of contrast media reaction. And she received the Moderna uh, vaccine and about eight days later, uh, sends you this picture of large local swelling, redness, um, you advise antihistamine, Benadryl, probatasol, and over the next six, seven days, so about 14 days after vaccination, the symptoms completely resolve. And the question is, you know, what do I do for my next dose? And so we advise take an antihistamine. So she took cetirizine, went ahead and received her second dose of Moderna, and then calls because about three days later, there's a similar reaction. Um, and this time, topical steroids, antihistamine, and, and five days later, so about eight days after, the symptoms completely resolve. And I highlight this case because um, delayed reactions have been reported and they have been commonly reported and they are not a contraindication to getting the next dose. And what we do see is that it can occur again with the next dose. So in this case, we were talking a lot about the reaction occurring with the first dose and the individual going on and getting it with the second dose. But in this case, also reassuring individuals that they can get the third dose or the booster dose and that they can use antihistamine pre-medication as well as topical steroids, um, but really just comfort measures that there is no severe reaction. This is not cellulitis. They do not need antibiotics, but it is a delayed local reaction that is occurring and very commonly described with the vaccines. Um, and so again, highlighting the point that this is not a contraindication. You can use ice, antihistamine, topical steroids. You don't need to treat this with antibiotics. And so just a couple of summary points for COVID-19 vaccine um, allergy reactions is, again, delayed reactions are not a contraindication. The immediate allergic reactions or symptoms that occur is really the place where I think allergy um, can play a role. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about skin testing because I think that the thinking has changed quite a bit from when we first started to now. And I think that there are times where skin testing to the excipients can be very useful to help that individual feel reassured that they're not gonna have a reaction because the amount of 
um, polyethylene glycol that we're using in skin testing is more than what's in the vaccine. And so I think it provides a lot of reassurance. But what we still don't know is, is polyethylene glycol the cause of reactions? And I think that what we're learning is that it's less and less so the reaction um, cause, except in extremely rare cases. And so there is a role for it. Um, there is a role for vaccine testing. And so those are some of the nuances that I think that we've learned a lot and changed our thinking and, and are in, in some of the algorithms that we've put forth. Um, but to then talk a little bit about a couple of other aspects of this is, are these reactions that we're seeing anaphylaxis? And I think this gets at one of the questions that Dr. Cohen brought up. And allergic reactions are typically very objective where you'll have hives, you'll have respiratory symptoms, but other reactions can mimic anaphylaxis. So vasovagal reactions occur very commonly with injections and you can have syncope, you can have bradycardia, you can have pallor, as opposed to tachycardia and flushing, which happens more with anaphylaxis. Vocal cord dysfunction or vocal cord spasm can cause stridor and dyspnea, which are very often mistaken for allergic reactions. We also know that anxiety or panic attacks can cause that global sensation or palpitations of dyspnea or other symptoms that again, can mimic um, allergic reactions. And I just put one example uh, of a publication, but there are multiple publications about these aspects where immunizations or vaccine uh, stress responses um, can be mistaken for allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions. And I think we have to spend a lot of time thinking about what are the symptoms and how can we help that individual go on to proceed with safe vaccination. And then I wanted to just spend the last minute or two, and then I'll, I'll take questions if there are any, just talking about vaccine hesitancy, because I know that we see this, you're seeing this, and there's been a lot of um, requests for vaccine exemptions. And in my mind and in my practice, really not an allergic reaction that um, would lead to vaccine exemptions other than true anaphylaxis within the first two to four hours. Um, but this was a survey that was completed um, by the Kaiser Family Foundation, which looked at those who say they will definitely not get the vaccine, what were these reasons? So this data was from the spring of 2021 and probably has changed. Um, but some of the reasons when we're having conversations with them is really to understand why are they hesitant to get the vaccine? And so some of it was, you know, the vaccines are very new. They don't believe it's effective against COVID-19. Some feel they don't need it. Um, but I think really spending the time to understand why that person in front of you is hesitant to get the vaccine goes a long way in trying to help them understand why they can proceed with COVID-19 vaccination. And then really, what was the most effective message? So what can we as providers talk about? Um, and so this was the survey saying, uh, percent of patients who say they're more likely to get the COVID-19 vaccine if they heard one of these things. And so some of the important messages are that the vaccines are nearly 100% effective in preventing hospitalization and death. And I think that message still holds true. Um, the other message is that although COVID-19 vaccines are new, the idea that the technology and the research has been there for the last two decades. Um, and, and so just thinking about what messages can we give those individuals that are sitting in front of us to help them proceed with safe vaccination, which I think we all believe is more and more important as we are now into the second year of this, maybe third year, more variants. Um, and so then really um, important messages for us to think about. So I'll end there and say thank you for your time. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll open up the chat for anybody that has uh, questions or comments. Um, and Dr. Uh, Banerjee, I wanted to ask, you know, one of the common concerns that I get from patients, regardless of which vaccine they are thinking about taking, is about the pulmonary embolism 
that occurred following uh, the, the, or the concerns about the pulmonary embolism following J&J &J vaccine. How do you counsel patients about that? So as, as the allergist, it's not usually what comes to our office, but um, it certainly has come up. And I think that, you know, it is a lot of risk benefit. And when you look at the data and you try to show the data to patients and use some of these slides actually, that the benefit of these vaccines is so high and that the, the risk is not getting the vaccine or not getting the vaccine. It's really about the vaccine versus a COVID-19 infection. And I try to explain it in that context. Um, and I think that reframes the conversation. But I mean, I think there are times where no matter what we say, we don't really make much uh, progress with that individual. And so I think it's not always just a one-time conversation but multiple conversations and really using the data um, to, to talk to that individual. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I was going to say that there's patients that you just can't convince. I had a patient Monday who very angry at me because I wouldn't write an exemption letter because she has chronic urticaria and that's not a contraindication of vaccination with COVID. And I um, was not happy when I told her the NIH said that was not a contraindication. This is a patient resistant to medications, won't take Zolair. So she has, um, so she has, you know, uncontrolled on antihistamines, not well controlled chronic urticaria, but you can't convince some people. Um, and you just have to stand up that I can't write you a letter because it really isn't indicated. And yeah. not, you know, you can't make everyone happy. But my, my, I have one question, which is, do you see we don't right now skin test with vaccine for people that really might be helpful. Do you see us getting to that point where we would be able to do that rather than the PEG skin test, which is, as you said, maybe being less important at this point? But no, I have. think, yeah. So when you look at a lot of the vaccine um, practice parameters and things like that, vaccine skin testing has been part of our practice previously for vaccine reactions, including thinking about the excipients and, and the other substances in the vaccine. And for a long time, the vaccine was such a, a commodity that couldn't be wasted. And so we weren't able to use it for skin testing. And I know some groups um, were using kind of that small amount that was left as waste after they took out you know, the five doses or the 10 doses that were in the vial. Um, but we actually are, we have not been able to get the hospital to let us use vaccine for skin testing. And it's quite frustrating because I do think a lot of this work is to reassure the patient rather than me thinking that I'm going to figure out if they're allergic or not. I think there's a lot of value when the patient sees that it's negative. And I think that's true of a lot of the drug allergy testing that we do where we really use it for reassurance and then we can give the vaccine or the drug in front of us where the patient feels reassured sitting in front of us getting it. Um, and so I think a lot of that really needs to happen. I do think there is value in vaccine skin testing to your point. And I hope that we can get there um, in those cases where we feel that the symptoms meet true severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis within that two to four hours, where I think that is of value and probably maybe getting to that point more so than the excipient testing. Unless someone has anaphylaxis to go lightly or anaphylaxis to Miralax. And I think those cases um, are probably um, a little bit different than, than vaccine allergy. Um, thanks. On a, a slightly different note, um, I think that more people are aware of the vaccine adverse event reporting system now than ever be before if you <laughs> combined all of them. Um, I wonder if you can speak to that, sy that system, uh, how, the case, how the cases are uh, collected, the validity of that system and how we can use it as physicians. Yeah. So I think that as physicians, when a reaction occurs, it should be reported to VAERS. And it's pretty straightforward to log in, enter information and so on. The, the downside of it is that we are reporting clinical symptoms 
that then need to be validated. And so when you look at a lot of this data, um, they're not always truly anaphylactic cases. And so that's why there's that range of you know, anywhere from two to a million out to eight or 10 to a million and other publications showing the numbers being slightly different um, based on how you're validating it, what criteria you're using it. Is it just based on symptom reporting or are you calling that individual, looking at tryptase levels, how much data do you have? And so I think the system is good but there is going to be under-reporting, over-reporting, depending on the situation um, and when you're collecting data and who's entering that data. Thank you very much. Um, and what about use of it in the literature? I think it's good. I think you have to take it knowing that this is how the data is coming in versus you know, single site, you know, taking every single case, validating all the symptoms, talking to the patient, and, and really um, thoroughly vetting that history. And so I think it's data, but knowing how you're getting that data is always going to be important and how you interpret it. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, well, if there's any more questions that anybody wants to post in the chat, um, and if not, uh, Dr. Banerjee, thank you so much for being with us today. It's um, very uh, fascinating and, and topical and relevant information that we can all use to counsel our patients. May I ask one quick question, Dr. Banerjee? Do you skin test or do in vitro for gelatin? We, um, we do both, depending on the history. So it's, it's pretty straightforward to get the IgE. Um, right. And then we think about doing vaccine skin testing. Um, and sometimes gelatin skin testing, because that's also easy to obtain. But in those cases, we often will do vaccine and skin testing. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, it, was, it was a pleasure to speak with you and I wish you a wonderful holiday season. Happy New Year. Thank you, same to you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now.